Hi, my name is Chris White from ZeitgeistChallenge.com. I'm here to comment on a recent interview from Peter Joseph. He is the director of the movie Zeitgeist and Acharya S., who he's interviewing, who was the consultant for part one of the movie. She was also cited over 31 times under different names by Zeitgeist for some of the most controversial claims of the movie. It comes out in the interview that Joseph asked Acharya to write a short ebook called The Real Zeitgeist Challenge to attempt to respond to the website that Frank Lordy and I have put up called zeitgeistchallenge.com. The book also directly quotes from me and a previous video that I did analyzing Acharya's first such response to critics at asking her where she got her information that was used so prominently in the film Zeitgeist the Movie and I will link that here in the description section. You will note that through this interview it appears that Joseph brought her on the show to answer word for word the challenge that is posted on the Zeitgeist Challenge website. It seems apparent that Joseph thought that she would have the answers to some of those questions. After all, she did claim these things to be true in her books, and Joseph has already endorsed Acharya's work to a generation of truth seekers with his movie. And you'll notice very quickly that the answers that she gives are not too convincing. So let's take a look at this discourse, and I want you all, no matter what side of the fence you are on, to listen to this discussion. This is supposed to be the answer to the critics. This is the big game. Acharya S., the consultant for the movie, and Peter Joseph, the director, are about to try to answer all the big questions that the debunkers have been asking. So keep an open mind and decide which one of us has a more compelling argument. Also, please note that I will be editing the audio slightly because of time constraint purposes but I will not leave out any information that is vital or helpful in any way to their case, and I will link the full interview for your review in the description section. Okay, so let's get started. Here's our host, Peter Joseph and Achari S. As you know, uh, debunkers will go after every tiny little thing without doing any research. I believe that's the game of debunkers is semantic manipulation and fragmentation, from what I understand. I know that you've had your experience with, with that as well. Well said. Yes, it's a never-ending game, and it seems to be a game with no rules except on their side. <laughs> yeah, well, they're, they're making the rules, evidently. Yeah, yeah, changing the way we do research. Yes, precisely. And, and when it comes to... acceptable. Yes, and when it comes to, uh, well, also to fit their world views that, you know, many of them are emotionally inclined to protect, and that's, of course, one of the sensitive aspects with, with religion, as you, you so well know. It would be illogical for me to suggest that I am not emotionally inclined in some way to protect my beliefs about religion, but I would suggest that both of these individuals are equally emotionally inclined to protect their beliefs about religion, and I would submit very much more so than me or any other Christian. After all, if they are wrong, the consequences are very dire, metaphysically speaking. Not so with me or any other Christian. In addition, both of these speakers' entire professional careers are tied up in their belief that Jesus wasn't real. I assume that they both make money off this idea and have quite a bit emotionally tied to it in that sense, the sense that their belief about religion puts resources on the table. You will hear assertion after assertion by these two that the other side aren't willing to believe them because of their emotions, but I want to make this very clear. I am only interested in what they say their proof for their claims in the movie Zeitgeist are. I have waited a very long time to hear them. I have offered money to anyone that can produce this evidence. So that's what I want, the evidence. So what we can do today is begin to expand on a lot of these things that people hear and they go to an encyclopedia and they say, wait a minute, it doesn't say that in my encyclopedia. And, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean... Encyclopedia uh, surfing, I call it. Oh. Yes, exactly. And that's that's, you know, that's the general nature of most debunkers these days anyway. Um so I, I'm going to, you know, we can, I'm looking right now at the Zeitgeist Challenge website, and I'm looking at all the claims that are made by, made by uh, the film that they say basically doesn't exist and they want proof of. So how do you want to do this? Uh, for one, I can just basically, you know, Horace, for example. We have Horace born on December 25th, which most people don't seem to understand that we're talking about the winter solstice more than anything else. Would you expand on the birth of Horace? And you can go in whatever direction you like yeah. as far as these points. Sure. Let me, let me explain a couple of things about how the historical process and scholarship work. First of all, not everything makes it into the diction or the encyclopedia. Okay? Right, sure. the encyclopedia surfing is completely inadequate. Uh, right. these, these things have been censored, censored. Uh, these are very, talk about short digest. You know, right. I mean, this is just a few paragraphs on a subject, and they don't put in the stuff that's going to upset the status quo. 
Okay. Yeah. This stuff has been edited out. There was something called the Inquisition. Ever heard of it? They destroyed thousands and thousands of books for the very purpose that we're talking about now, that this information is not in those books because they didn't want it in there. So I had to dig up this stuff. Some of this stuff is not is barely even translated into English. If you go to Christ in Egypt, you'll find some translations for the first time into English. Right. I had to do uh, dig up stuff that was in German, handwritten German. It was extremely difficult. That was, uh, and on this specific issue, in fact, the December 25th, or rather the winter solstice celebration in ancient Egypt, you'll see people go, oh, well, I've, I've actually seen uh, Egyptologists have read where they said there doesn't seem to be any you know, winter solstice acknowledgement in Egypt. And I'm going, well, yeah, there certainly is. Here are a bunch of hieroglyphs. Remember, the question that she's been asked is, where does it say that Horus was born on December 25th, which is the first question on the Zeitgeist Challenge website? But two points really quick. She immediately appeals to the idea that the main reason this isn't obvious to other scholars, um, except for her, is that is because of a truly massive Christian conspiracy, where Christians destroyed all pagan references that conflicted with their religion. I would like to point out, as I did in the first refutation of her defending a zeitgeist, that she should produce a logical reason why she thinks that during this time when Christians were being crucified and burned alive uh, for refusing to deny Christ by the Roman Empire, that that same Roman Empire gave them some kind of authority to march into temples and homes of pagans and steal and destroy their literature. And if they want to say it's because the Roman Church later, and about 400 years later, decided to go back and destroy all the evidence that conflicted with it, you still have the problem of them, or anyone else, not knowing what the Egyptian hieroglyphics said at that point, only having been recently been able to be interpreted and therefore wouldn't be a target of any rampaging Christians because they would have no idea which hieroglyphics said what about Horus being born on December 25th or being crucified, etc. So you should have this pristine record of Horus being born on December 25th or being crucified and all these other things in Egyptian writings. And I'm even willing to say that they might have to be interpreted in such a way to produce that. But nevertheless, there should be a... a a full body of evidence in that regard to this day that would not have been a target of the Catholic Church or rampaging Christians. Why even appeal to this argument if you have solid evidence to prove uh, the, the initial claim in the first place? Why even say, well, first before we get started here, I just want you to know that all the evidence was destroyed. But keep in mind, the question here that she's been asked is, where does it say in the Egyptian writings, preferably, but really any other writing before 33 AD, that Horus was said to be born on December 25th? That is the question. In fact, they include in the book, the hieroglyph for the winter solstice, it shows the, the, gods, uh, the goddesses Isis and Nephis on either side of the sun, holding a, like a baby sun over an ankh, giving life to the sun. This is the, the hieroglyph for wow. the winter solstice. So they have this beautiful hieroglyph, in fact, to describe the winter solstice. The winter solstice was extremely important in uh, ancient Egypt. There are many buildings aligned to the winter solstice. Uh, the Temple of Luxor, I believe, is one. There are, in fact, here's, here's where, when you're talking about the December 25th birthday, okay, now, first of all, why that day and it's not the 21st, 22nd? That needs to be explained, too. There's a three-day period a trigium or a trigium that uh, that the ancients recognized that at that that point it seemed like for three days the sun was not moving either south or north. You know, this is from a geocentric perspective uh, that it, that it was dead in a tomb, so to speak, because that's where it seemed to be going into the tomb. It was going to die. It was this is towards the winter solstice when everything is getting the days are getting shorter and shorter. And so there seemed to be this. There's this three-day period where the, the the sun on the sundial seemed to be not moving at all, and the, the sun was dead. So they they said that it stopped. Solstice means sun stops. Sun stops moving. So uh, the solstice, the sun stopped for three days, and then it was born again. And, and it would be you know 24th at midnight, basically. So that's why we have this Christmas Eve thing going on. So it's not a mistake to say that the sun was born again on the 25th. No one is really arguing any of those points. The question is in regard to Horus's birth. It is, of course, incredibly noteworthy at this point to point out that Jesus was emphatically not born on December 25th, 
even from a purely literary perspective, no ancient text that I'm aware of ever refers to a birth for Jesus on that day or any other day, and that the holiday was constructed several hundred years later, and it was actually based on ancient pagan practices that were established by Rome's version of Christianity in order to appease the pagans in Rome. This is why many Christians, like the earliest Christians, don't celebrate Christmas on that day because it was widely known to be a pagan holiday. And so the early Christians, when they were told several hundred year le years later that they now had to begin celebrating Jesus' birthday on December 25th, they were very reluctant because they knew the Bible didn't say anything about it, but they did know that it was an ancient sun worship thing. So they refused and often were killed for refusing. But remember, the question is, where does it say that Horus was born on December 25th? Okay, that's not a mistake. That's has the ancient tradition, and there's a reason for it. It wasn't like there's some calendar issues going on. Calendar is very fascinating. I've been working on a calendar. I'm going to be releasing that soon. Okay. Uh, the cal calendar is very fascinating to follow too. However, so uh, when we're talking about the winter solstice, December 25th is fine to acknowledge because it is part of the winter solstice, the three-day period. Okay, yeah. so we have for Horus, for example, we have this ancient testimony called Plutarch. Plutarch is about as close as we're going to get to a kind of a digest, an encyclopedia. Uh, Di Diodorus Siculus, before that, in the first century B.C., uh, also had, lays this out. Herodotus does a little bit, but not quite the same as uh, writing a kind of an encyclopedia entry type thing. Otherwise, we don't necessarily have these, this type of writing going back to, in this, to these eras before that. So in other words, she doesn't have any Egyptian claims whatsoever that Horus was born on December 25th. Let me remind everyone that the question posed by the Zeitgeist Challenge website is to show any source before Christ that states any of this stuff. And she here tells us point blank that the best she has is Plutarch, who lived well after the death of Christ. She appeals to him later, and we will discuss Plutarch in greater detail there, in addition, because no one at the time of Plutarch could read hieroglyphics to the best of our knowledge, how is he the authority on the Egyptian view of the birth of Horus? Would it make more scientific, logical sense uh, to find evidence of the, this claim about Horus's birth nowadays, with hieroglyphics now being able to be read? Let me tell you, if Acharya knew of any Egyptian reference to Horus being born on December 25th, you can bet that she would be telling us that right now instead of Plutarch. But she appeals to Plutarch here, who, as a priest of Delphi, certainly has his own religious reasons for making these claims. But we'll look into that later. For one thing, uh, as I explain in this this document that I just created, especially for you on this show, called right. Zeitgeist Challenge, The Real Zeitgeist Challenge, which can be accessed at my website, truthbeknown.com. Right. I have it right there at the top now, so it's, you just can go right there and ba-boom. Oh, good. Uh, I, I describe what it, about this primary source business, which is a little, there's all this squawking about primary sources, this and that. First of all, there are no primary sources for Christianity, so, you know, people in glass houses shouldn't be throwing stones. Uh, secondly... Good point. Actually, Peter, it's a terrible point. She tries to make this claim later on, too, essentially saying that the debunkers want primary sources to prove the physical existence of Krishna or Horus, etc., which is the definition of a straw man argument. The truth is that the primary sources are sought with regard to what the ancient texts said about the various demigods, regardless of whether they existed or not. I and others are asking to be shown what the Egyptians believed about such and such God. Whether or not it was physically true is not being debated, at least by me. That being said, as an aside, I would like to ask you to see my video on the evidence of the existence of the historical Jesus. Secondly, uh, the, what this does all the time raises this incredibly infuriating uh, uh, historical period that, of destruction. Here she has another diatribe about how the Christians destroyed all of the evidence that she would have liked to produce. And I'm going to skip ahead to some more meteor topics. How come the Christian writings all survive, but the pagan ones don't? So right. whenever you hear this primary sources thing, that's what you should be reminded of. The pagan history has been destroyed deliberately. Why? Well, we can kind of piece these things together. So we don't have these things like a little neat little encyclopedia entry, but we have indications of it, and then we can go back and check. 
we have this Plutarch specifically stating that Horus was born at the winter solstice. So what do we find out to co corroborate that? We find out, first of all, that he's accurate in almost everything else he says, and this is stated by an Egyptologist. I disagree, and I will give a very logical reason why it is imperative to doubt Plutarch, primarily because scholars of Plutarch recognize that it was his style in the book Parallel Lives to fabricate information about certain historical figures in order to make parallels. This is a quote from Rex Warner, the author of Fall of the Roman Republic, Six Lives by Plutarch. This is from the translator's introduction. Plutarch stretches and occasionally fabricates the similarities between famous Greeks and Romans in order that he may write their biographies as a parallel. The lives of Nicias and Crassus, for example, have nothing in common except that both were rich and both suffered great military defeats at the end of their lives. So the very thing that Acharya is saying that Plutarch is good for, i.e., drawing parallels in different lives, is the one thing that scholars know without question that he occasionally lies about. So we have no reason to doubt him. He's not playing to a Christian audience that's going to say, oh, that's not true, because there isn't such a thing at that point. This is interesting that she claims that there is no Christian influence on Plutarch, kind of suggesting that he was pre-Christian, because she doesn't tell anybody that he's actually very much not pre-Christian. But nevertheless, uh, she says there wasn't any Christian influence on him, and while I agree that it is possible, considering Plutarch never, to the best of my knowledge, mentions the Christians, it is not very probable considering that he died in 120 A.D., and he lived in Greece and traveled extensively to places like Corinth and to Rome, where, according to his Roman and Greek contemporaries, like Pliny the Younger and Suetonius and Tacitus, Christian persecution was in full swing in those areas. Uh, he's not, nobody's going to attack him. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's no reason for him to be telling any kind of falsehoods about the story. There's no sure. reason at all. I will now play a very short clip from the late William Cooper. Nearly all writers attempting an interpretation of the Osirian cycle have recourse to Plutarch. It has seemingly never occurred to Egyptologists that this eminent priest of Delphi might have purposely confused or distorted the fable, or, if not that, might certainly have misdirected the attention of the reader from relevant to irrelevant explanations. Two factors must certainly be taken into consideration when reading Plutarch. First, he was an initiated priest of the mysteries. And there are a lot of reasons why this is interesting, but I'll just break it down to the very basic problem, is that Plutarch was incredibly religiously biased as a worshiper of Apollo, who, according to Diodorus, was the same as the worship of Horus. Apollo later became the idea of worshiping this the sun and the solstice, as, in a, as we'll see later with Gerald Massey, as a chief druid. He worshipped at the winter solstice. He had every religious reason for making history conform to his religious beliefs. This is extremely important to recognize that everything that they're saying about Christians applies to the sources that they're using to prove their version of history. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's no reason for him to be telling any kind of falsehoods about the story. There's sure. no reason at all. Well, he did worship Horus, so maybe that's one reason. And let me once again remind you the question, the first question that she was asked here, and all this has been about, is where does it say that Horus was born on December 25th? Absolutely. So what do we find? We find that Yes, indeed, uh, the, the birth of the sun is discussed in inscriptions prior to the, to the Common Era. We find also that there are temples to Raharakti, which is uh, an, one of the aspects of the sun god, the Horus, Ra com combination. Uh, these temples are aligned to the winter solstice rising sun. And here's a little clincher, and I, I'm so loath to give out some of this information because it took me so long to dig it up and put it together. And it's in oh, my I'm book. Sure there's, such, there's great stuff in that book that you that I you cannot even imagine how long it took me to find like one paragraph. Oh, I, I, I can imagine. I, I saw the intensity <laughs> of that book. By all means, I certainly recommend it. Twenty four hundred citations. Right. And there are nine hundred sources. And they're, right. They're they're. they're uh, I learned Egyptian on the spot. To, you know, not all not all of it. It takes of years and years. <laughs> it's a hugely difficult language, and then you have to learn the hieroglyphs. Hieroglyphs themselves are astonishing. 
you know, to sweep all this under the carpet with this namby pamby efforts at debunking is just sickening to me. Frankly. Oh, I understand. Yeah, it's just it's just degenerate uh, rejection. You know, we just have <laughs> I to like deal that, with that. Degenerate. Yeah. What were you going to so, say about the uh, the issue that you found, though? You can give it give it away to us. Oh yeah. Well, here it goes. Okay. <laughs> The fact is that Horus is the morning sun on every day, okay? So Horus is born every day of the year. Interesting. So if this, he wasn't born on December 25th, that would be the only day that he isn't born, according to the Egyptians. It's so ridiculous. Of course he's born on December 25th. He's born every single day. Um, did you catch that? Now we have regressed to this. This was her, like, I hate to divulge this information that I dug up, but Horus was born every single day. Now, this means, of course, that Horus, and I have a lot in common, because Horus was born, did you know this, on August 21st, which is the exact same day that I was born. Hmm, that's pretty interesting. If it's really her explanation, the one that she dug up and is so proud of, then it really makes the movie Zeitgeist absolute mind control, because you watch that movie when it talks about this this serious accusation that the Egyptian god Horus was said to have been born on December 25th, and they say that that's the same day that Jesus was born. Horus is the morning sun, rise the sun at noon, Tom or Tmu Atum, Tmu is the sun in the evening, and then Osiris becomes the sun at night. Gotcha. And I explain all of this in my book, and how this works, that these guys are, like, they are not necessarily the sun themselves, Ra is becoming Horus and Osiris, it's very complicated. But it also this this complication also means that that there's this interchange uh, changeability going on, which is kind of what is reflected in that list that you give in ZG. That right. Um, right. You say Os Horus was uh, buried for three days. It's actually really Osiris, but see Horus is the rebirth of Osiris, so right. you know, they really are one. Exactly. So, I made that point to other people is that no one seems that's been well documented by other historians as well. These are interchangeable trans they transfer, these information transfers. These these gods were very different in their structure than than the Christian gods or the gods that we, we talk about today. They were they morphed, so to speak, in their uh, identities, would you say? Highly interchangeable. She's talking about interchangeability, he's talking about morphing. He's saying they morphed because they didn't have the characteristics of any of the Christian stories until they morphed. That's why they are quoting people like Plutarch and those that lived after the time of Christ. She's saying that they're interchangeable. And I'm saying, okay, if Horus and, and Osiris are interchangeable, that's quite all right. You can take the requirements in the Zeitgeist Challenge for Horus, and you can just assume that it's Osiris or Horus, but you still have the problem of answering these questions. Was Horus or Osiris born on December 25th? Were any of them born of a virgin? Were their births accompanied by a star in the east? Did three kings follow to locate and adorn the newborn savior? At the age of 12, did either of them, uh, were, did they become a prodigal child teacher? At the age of 30, were either of them baptized to begin their ministry? Did either of them have 12 disciples? Did either of them perform miracles such as healing the sick, walking on water? Were either of them known as the truth of light? Were they crucified? Were they buried after three days? and resurrected. That's still the Zeitgeist Challenge. I don't care if it's Horus or Osiris. Uh, and trust me, if either one of those, uh, they had, if they had data for any of that, that's what we'd be hearing now. But we're hearing excuse after excuse after excuse. Well, I know Massey made it very clear that the uh, parallel between God and Jesus was also a parallel between Osiris and Horus, and along many other parallels. And of course, as you know, in Christian rhetoric, Jesus and God are basically interchangeable, if I remember correctly. So there's a little bit That's of that right. char characteristic emerging there too, correct? The Holy Spirit too. Yes, exactly. And we have yeah, a, we have a kind of a Holy Spirit uh, knum. I'm not sure how to pronounce these things. Nobody is really. Uh, we have oh, these yeah. different, you know, we have these different characters in the Egyptian too, with the, with the base um, having to deal with resurrection and, and afterlife. They were extremely interested in the afterlife and, and continuity of life and sure. immortality of the soul and so forth. And, you know, raising mass is a good point, too, because as I show in Christ in Egypt, this information in no way relies upon him. Right. He just happens to be someone who is laudable because he saw it. He saw it very clearly. And he, in fact, is extremely highly peer-reviewed, by the way. 
he had his work uh, combed over by some of the best Egyptologists and scholars of the day. And I show that in my book, Christ in Egypt. There's an online excerpt as well, and I link to all of this in this uh, Zeitgeist Challenge ebook that I've created. Uh, so the man deserves much greater respect than the, just this, you know, uh, hand waving dismissal of, oh, he's this or that. The guy rose from absolute poverty with no real education, had to work as a child in, you know, serious labor back in the, the bad old days in, that, in those countries. In that right. country was Great Britain, uh, and and became extremely well known among. The Egyptologists of the day. It's so fact, in fact, uh, his. You know, we have our counterparts today attacking us. The people who attacked him, uh, in particular, there was a uh, a Catholic Egyptologist who just would rant and rave against him because uh, he was a Catholic. <laughs> of course, you know? that's, yeah. <laughs> it's very hard to take. I hate to say it, but it's very hard to take the criticisms of people that are in, indoctrinated into this faith that seriously because they obviously have a vested interest in their belief and I, I that sounds you know a little bit I don't know it sounds a little difficult to say but it's very very true this is an excellent time to talk about Gerald Massey and his vested interest in his religious belief which was Druidism let's first sit up and pay attention that Massey was cited 31 times in the movie Zeitgeist the most outlandish claims were attributed to him this is second only to Acharya S., who is cited the same number of times, 31. These two authors therefore account for 62 of the most serious claims of the movie. So Peter is telling us how much he pities people with religious bias and how incapable they are of seeing past their ideas. Well, I wonder if this would apply to Gerald Massey. And before I say anything, I want to point out that I am not criticizing Massey simply because he was the chosen chief of the most ancient order of Druids for 26 years, but that the doctrine taught and presumably believed by Massey as a part of the Druidic order would certainly affect his research and would be, by Peter Joseph's own definition and own logic, untrustworthy because of extreme religious bias. Now, Gerald Massey was a member of the Ancient Order of Druids, and this is not to be confused with actual ancient Druids that were thrown out of countries because of human sacrifice, but um, more a Neo-Druidism, which is the same kind of Neo-Druidic order that Winston Churchill was initiated into about the same time. But essentially they worshipped or venerated the winter solstice, and they would gather at Stonehenge every year to celebrate this. The religious belief is essentially about reincarnation which, no matter which way you cut it, is a religious belief. Therefore, Massey, being head honcho of this order for 26 years, makes him one of the most religious people in history. There are many people who do criticize Massey's Egyptian translations, and even modern supporters of Massey know that he was a self-taught Egyptologist who rarely cites sources about his important claims. And while other debunkers, like Keith Thompson, have detailed this better, I would implore you to consider that if Massey was right and his translations were correct, why hasn't any modern Egyptologist confirmed any of it? If you're quick to point to a Christian conspiracy, I would say, well, what about the Muslim Egyptologist or the Chinese Egyptologist or those who have no emotional stake in this? Wouldn't there be someone on the earth that has read the same hieroglyphics or hieroglyphs that Gerald Massey has by now and confirmed it, if it was true? But I suggest the reason that his work is so different than, and the most logical reason is that he made it up to support his religious belief. Most of you would have no trouble believing this if it was a Christian. I'm just saying that this makes the most sense, all things considered. You mentioned uh, the other Egyptologist, such as Samuel Birch, who wrote, he actually wrote a dictionary on hieroglyphics, if I remember correctly, and he was <laughs> one that approved of many of Massey's writings. In fact, a lot of his own writings, I think, reflect the same information. That's right. Yeah. Uh, well, yes, and uh, and it was Samuel Birch or Sharp Birch. Okay, <laughs> you're reading this yeah. more recently than I am because this is, uh, you know, oh my gosh, this oh, is so, sure. there's so much information. It's just huge information, hugely important. Uh, well, actually, Samuel Sharp uh... is the one who wrote about wrote about this information, but Samuel okay. Birch is the one who Samuel Birch is the one who did peer review Massey. Right. Quickly to expand on my earlier point is that Samuel Birch was born in 1813, and the Rosetta Stone was found in 1799, and it still took people quite a long 
uh, time to even get to the very early stages of reading Egyptian hieroglyphs. Um, by the 1820s, the first complete decipherment was made. So this is very, very early on in the understanding of Egyptian hieroglyphs. Therefore, if Massey is correct, you're going to need more peer review than one done in the 1800s. You would need probably a modern uh, scholar, unbiased scholar, to look at Gerald Massey and say, yeah, he was right, even though he had very little to work with. And right. Was, he was uh, uh, Department of Antiquities or Egyptology at, uh, at the British Museum. Exactly. So that, that's really important, yes. That this, this, this was just not some crackpot, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so, if anyone's yeah, ever so, read his writings, they see, you, if you ever read Ancient Egypt, Light of the World, which is an amazing work, it, the only problem with that book to me is that he, he doesn't give enough sources. There you have it. Don't take it from me. There's the creator of Zeitgeist who cited this guy 31 times. And when you cite a guy who doesn't cite sources, it's like not citing a source. If you say Gerald Massey said it was true, but Gerald Massey doesn't cite a source then you've essentially cited no source, and this big list that Zeitgeist has provided is totally meaningless. That's the reason the Zeitgeist challenge exists. But he, right. his logic and is just unparalleled in his review of, of Egypt, and I just thought it was the most amazing book I had read in a long time when I read it years ago. Right. And if you, if, you, if you read my writing about him in Christ in Egypt, then you start to see where his sources are from. Exactly. Now, you've done, you've done the legwork, I think, for a lot of what Massey, uh, <laughs> his mind moved apparently too fast to uh, be concerned with such things. Um, you can actually find, you know, it's so fascinating using the Internet these days, you can look up the phrases that I was able to find the exact translations that he used. Excellent. Because uh, he's quoting translations in there that he didn't, as he said, I'm not making this up. I didn't, I, I'm quoting, I'm too, even though I can read hieroglyphs, he said, I'm too smart to do that. I'm quoting these, this was like uh, uh, Renouf's translation and uh, was it Birch's uh, translation that, so he so in any case, uh, the information that we're talking about here does not rely on Massey. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm still waiting on some information. So far, I've heard um, that Plutarch was their source, and I heard that also Horus was born on every day. And so far, that's basically what we have. So I'm still waiting for some actual sources. So maybe she is going to divulge all that she found from Massey here in the next few minutes, so we'll have an uh, opportunity to analyze some of it. Uh, and it also is not neatly written down. You have to; Some of it has to be figured out. Like it was difficult to come up with uh, the, uh, the Mary, Isis Mary, not that it isn't there, but because the word Mary has been used, it means beloved, by the way, right. it has been used in a different, two different ways. One is the gods are uh, bestowing love upon someone, and so the pharaoh is called Mary. He is beloved of the gods. And so that epithet is not necessarily attached to the gods. It, it is at that you say, Pa Mary, that would be someone is beloved of Ta, rather than Ta himself is beloved. Gotcha. So that that was difficult too, but so I have to go into many pages to explain that. But right. indeed, Isis was beloved, and she was called Mary. Okay, so let's look at this now. It's important to remember here that Acharya has already said this in her book, The Christ Conspiracy, that's been out for a long, long time. This is the first time she's ever tried to like look it up, apparently, and source it. And uh, I commend her for, for even trying to do that. But as she just got done mentioning there, it's like, hey, this was hard to kind of make that uh, true. And you can kind of see how it's – remember, she says that Isis was obviously a, um, a predecessor to Mary because they were named – she was named Mary. Isis Mary is what she said. Now, we find here, according to her, and whether this is all true or not, I'm not 100% sure, but she says that the, the name Mary, uh, it means beloved – uh, of one god or another, and that other gods were uh, attributing this name to themselves, such as Mary Abtwai, Mary Amen Setep, Mary Aten, Mary Ka Ra, Mary Mes, Mary Neder, and uh, Mary Mta, as well as Mary Sokar, Mary Horus, and Mary Osiris. So basically, every Egyptian god in Egypt was called Mary. And t even if this is true, which she doesn't actually say anywhere here that Mary Isis, these he all appear to be males. What she eventually does is say that um, that in the Greco-Roman era, and that's what she just got done saying, it's like, well, Isis was called Beloved, and what she's referring to there, in the Greco-Roman era, the temples of Isis were calling her Beloved or Love, 
and it still doesn't really fit in with her whole premise is that Isis was clearly Mary and this was all a very easy uh, you know predecessor to the Christian story but if every god in ancient Egypt was more frequently called Mary than she ever could have been even if she was other than in the Greek because she was called loved and it doesn't make any sense if that's the thing this is obviously a backtracking trying to you know save face and doing it having to do it with a lot of words but I want to go really quick into what she was talking about earlier which is trying to find what Massey was talking about because clearly in her Christ conspiracy book she just took everything Massey said and didn't source it because he didn't source it so now she has to try to go find the sources for Massey okay this is what she says uh, makes this true and remember just to look at all the hoops that had to be jumped through in order to make this even slightly true first of all we had to go to the common era um, in order not ancient Egypt we had to go into modern Isis worship if you will uh, and then we had to make everyone believe that Hathor is the same as Isis and that anytime anybody is just called loved they get to also be referred to as Mary even in not when you're not in ancient Egypt and you know just a lot of stuff so we'll just read the ever important Isis was in fact one of these goddesses known by the title of Mary especially a few centuries before and into the common era that goddesses were beloved or Mary is obvious from an enigmatic spell that invokes the goddess greatly beloved with red hair or who is greatly beloved with the red hair Birch renders this phrase the greatly beloved uh, red-haired mystical cow the red of hair as Faulkner translates the epitaph represents the much beloved referring to the cows who are undoubtedly representative of Hathor another mistress of the gods and sometimes mother of Horus in this regard, Massey refers to several times to Hathor Mary or Isis. After relating that in BD 17, Osiris Ani is found in Anu, which with the hair of Isis spread over him. Mer Massey further states that elsewhere the hair is assigned to Hathor, one of whose names is Mary. He also discusses Hathor, who is Mary. And the beloved of by name in the ritual so don't you see if she's already quoting just straight up in the Egyptian that all these other gods are clearly named Mary I mean, this one's called Mary this one's near Mary here's the source for that I mean yeah it's just right there but when it comes to Isis the whole point well the red hair of this cow and if you all make this and you go to this era and, and you make sure that it's just beloved and all this stuff and these rules then you get to call Isis Mary too well, so that's speaking of um, ISIS, is, uh, that's the other thing that the debunkers don't seem to uh, understand is that these things require explanation and they can't be sourced in one paragraph because you have to have an understanding of the mechanics of the Egyptian religion to get a grasp of this. For example, describe Absolutely. these are mysteries, correct? The oh, yeah, well, some of them are. Yeah, yeah so these describe are what that means because I don't think anyone knows what this, this, this even means, mysteries. The Egyptian mysteries. Right, the mysteries. Okay, now we have descriptions of mysteries of the fact that they exist, dating back to Herodotus, long before the Common Era, and so forth. Uh, now they're not necessarily written down because back then these what, what we're calling mysteries were uh, you would, if you exposed them, if you were initiated into the mysteries and you exposed them to the vulgar masses who were right. not initiated, or if you wrote them down, especially if you wrote them down, you could be killed. Right, it, was a right. it was a capital offense, and sure. so very few people wrote them down. You know, they, but, but they they do show up in like little bits and pieces in the writing. You can't you, you can and they cannot completely keep them out. For example, one of the greatest mysteries was the virgin birth, and so there's not like this great long treatise about it because you're not you weren't supposed to talk about it like that. You're right. supposed to write it down. But we find in places in the pre-Christian world. <laughs> <laughs> I want to emphasize that because I also have a definition of what is pre-Christian. That's another part, point that okay. I like to make. Uh, but And I do make that in my, my latest ebook and article that I wrote for you, Peter. Right. Uh, Thank you. The pre-Christian, that's also in Christ in Egypt. So that ISIS is specifically called the Great Virgin right. on the temple of Seti I at Abydos, which dates to, I think it was the 13th century B.C. And so we're talking about that she was long called the Great Virgin, uh, you know, centuries, over a millennium. Okay, let's take a look at this claim. First, 
if I find it interesting that if you Google this term, the Great Virgin and Isis and SETI, and, and put it all into a search engine, you only find links about Achari S's claim here, which I find is interesting because I think that there would be a lot more information about this if this is exactly what is uh, said on that wall. But for the sake of argument, let's assume that she is right and that this is exactly how it reads at the Temple of SETI. The massive problem here is that we have a much different definition for virgin than the ancient Egyptians did because an Egyptian virgin can have lots of sex and lots of children and still be called a virgin. Acharya seems to know this and this is why she writes the following in her book. Quote, Apparently in order to explain how these various goddesses can remain virgins after becoming mothers, Baderek et al conclude that the virginity indicated by hwn.t now this Egyptian word hwn.t is exactly the same word that she just got done quoting when she said hey Isis called herself the great hwn.t great virgin and here this is what she says Bader et al conclude that virginity indicated that by hwn.t is not virginity at all a distinction seemingly forced that would be unnecessary if the myth mythological and ast astrological nature of the stories were understood and this perpetual virginity comprehended as a mystery as it is with in Christianity she then says indeed Jesus's mother Mary was said to be a perpetual virgin explaining why she could give birth yet remain virginal now this is what really needs a citation of course she has no citation here um, to say that Jesus' mother Mary was said to be a perpetual virgin, explaining that she, why she could give birth yet remain virginal. And they go into a big laughing discussion about this in here in a second. But the massive problem here with this is that Jesus' mother was not a perpetual virgin at all. According to the Bible, um, the reason that it calls the birth of Jesus a virgin birth is because at the time of Jesus' birth, Mary had not had relations with any man. So she was a virgin at that point. She is obviously not a virgin forever, as her and Joseph go on to have several children, according to the Bible. In fact, two of Jesus' brothers, Jude and James, became great men of the early underground church. Isis may have been a perpetual virgin. I don't know. She clearly wasn't an actual virgin, even according to Acharya S. And it's a perpetual virginity, correct? Just like Krishna. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, well, yeah, well, yeah, there, there's an interesting, I explain that whole odd weirdness going on with the Krishna uh, uh, myth, too, because there's okay. all these people freaking out about that word. But, of course. But, uh, yes, the, like vir, like the Virgin Mary, who, you know, gives birth but is considered a virgin, even though in the New Testament it says that Christ has brothers and sisters. And we know right. that at least. Hey, actually, Peter, Joseph, and Acharya and S and I agree on this point. Um, that's because the Catholic Church came up with this doctrine, a doctrine that they just said, you have to believe this or, you know, you're going to get killed. And many people did get killed for not believing this very thing, which was that Mary was always a virgin. It makes no sense. The Bible clearly says that she wasn't, that, that Jesus had brothers. Like after that, Joseph and Mary did eventually consummate their marriage and have brothers and sisters. And, you know, the Jude and James, they wrote books in the Bible, for goodness sakes. But, you know, this is crazy to, to just say, hey, there it is. And then to have the Catholic Church say, no, it's not. It's a perpetual virginity. What you're calling Christianity, you're telling everybody that, that real Christianity is this weirdness of perpetual virginity and anything else that the Catholic Church tells you that Christianity is, and you're, and you're seeing what the Bible is saying is totally different than that. So maybe for once they're kind of seeing um, what I'm talking about, but obviously they don't because they go on to make that quite clear. You know, I love uh, how people just miss that entirely. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> well, amazing. there's at least two sisters, and there's four brothers. The four brothers are named, and so there's right. at least six other children. And the the Catholic Church has, you know, um, covered up this part by saying, well, they're cousins. They're cousins. Right. Exactly. They're cousins. Oh, okay. Well, we'll just or ignore they, them as cousins. Or they say and, the gesture of the brothers is these are these are somebody semantically manipulated, which is yes, that's right. Too. Yeah, yeah. Or, or uh, they were from Joseph's prior marriage. All of a sudden, Joseph has a prior marriage. Uh, we, 
<laughs> you know, they have to just keep adding to the story. Right, exactly. So that's not in the Bible, though, so we can't talk about that. It's not right. ordained. Um, so anyway, with the brothers and the sisters, you know, the Virgin Mary, they talk about her as being perpetually virginal. And that, in fact, is an old motif, too. And we have this, we have this discussion in Philo, and I go into great detail in, in Christ in Egypt about this virgin birth mystery in Philo, this ancient Jewish writer who absolutely had nothing to do with Christianity except that Christianity apparently copied him almost whole cloth. Wow. But he... he I'm pretty sure she's referring to the theories of Bruno Bauer here, uh, who she's quoted on her website as uh, apparently uh, liking his writings. Bruno Bauer was a, a German writer who uh, was a contemporary of Nietzsche and, you know, Marx and Engels. And, um, well, I mean, just look up refutations of Bruno Bauer out there. And this is kind of too lengthy to go into right now, but I would just tell you that, uh, like so many other things, it's, it's just wrong. Uh, you can also check out... Uh, uh, I did a something called uh, Pollyannity Debunked, a three-part series on that, which Bruno Bauer uh, espouses as well. So there's lots of different ways to debunk Bruno Bauer. But, yeah, moving on. He certainly did not copy Christianity. Uh, but he talks about the virgin birth, and he talks about, interestingly enough, a sort of born-again virginity, which comes through the grace of God. And he speaks of this Abraham, Abraham's wife, Sarah, as being a born-again virgin, and so uh, this is the Jewish uh, discussion. Of course, you don't, they don't talk about gods and goddesses, but we have this virgin birth thing going on here that they're completely, obviously, completely aware of it in the pagan world, too, that, that the, the Jews were aware of this. That's why they, they changed the word in uh, Isaiah 7.14 from Alma to Parthenos when they translated it into the Greek. They're obviously aware that there's this virgin birth motif going on. Now, this is an argument in my fa favor that that on close inspection, it does appear that the the ancient prophet Isaiah was in fact saying that the Messiah would be born of a virgin it It's not something that the Jewish people would have immediately noticed, but when when they looked back on the prophecies of the Messiah and they could see you know it does say that he would be born of a virgin. So they changed it because it was too close to Jesus. Now, rem remember what we're talking about here, that the Bible is talking about a virgin birth in the sense of it's saying in a very historical way that a woman who had never had sex gave birth to a child. Not any perpetual virginity or no extra baggage is needed. That's the issue with the Zeitgeist Challenge. They said, and have been saying since Zeitgeist, that Isis... And all these other gods, like Devaki, uh, the mother of uh, Krishna, also had virgin births in the sense that, you know, they said they had virgin births in the movie, but now we find out, oh, no, 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 they weren't virgins when they gave birth. Um, Isis was never said to be a virgin. What are you, crazy? No, we were talking about perpetual um, mystery uh, virginity. Krishna? Oh, no, she's not in the virgin in the sense that there was a virgin birth. She had seven children before she gave birth to uh, Krishna. We have uh, Isis being called the great virgin. Many other goddesses are talked about this way. The, the goddess Neith, who is somewhat interchangeable with Isis. We have on a, uh, the temp her temple at Sais, which is pre-Christian, where she talks about no mortal has lifted up by cloth, and this is an indication that she's virginal. She doesn't come out and say, I'm the great virgin, which Isis does at the temple of Sethi the first. But she does say, I am uh, untouched, and, I, and yet I bring forth the sun, S-U-N. So this, this motif wow. is there, and yeah, it's solid. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and exactly. yet, you know, like I said, you can't just point to, you have to point to these various uh, elements of it. Right. You can't just say, there's nobody sat down and wrote, well, look, uh, you know, this is like, let's say 200 B.C. here. Um, well, Christianity's going to come along, so I better write this beforehand. Um, <laughs> that, you know, n nobody, nobody thought to do that. They right. just sit down and say, let's prove that our thing came first because someone's going to come later and copy it and then pretend that we didn't exist. Right. You know, the, the, I thought it would be great to find that. You know, they'd have to be incredibly psychic, though. So. <laughs> well, let's. Um, is there anything else on the Horus subject that you want to address? Because there's this, that list. Maybe it's in front of you as well. But it, because so we're, we're moving quickly yeah. with time, but there's all the other gods right. too. You can basically touch on whatever you'd like to with uh, this list that uh, the Zeitgeist Challenge has. Yeah, let me look. Has. 
Okay, let's say uh, let's see. The horse was crucified. The business. Okay, now you know it does give an indication, kind of, kind of a, a suggestion that he was killed that way. But right. you know, I mean, I, you're, you're giving a digest here. He wasn't really killed by being crucified. No. Oh, this should be interesting. How Horus was crucified but didn't die. Also, I would like to know, you know, who invented crucifixion? I guess the ancient Egyptians did. I guess we'll find out about that in a second. We do have a pre-Christian, by the way, the Diodorus. Really, Cruz didn't die from crucifixion. Um, that none of the gods in the Zeitgeist Challenge, you know, what they said, because they said all these gods were crucified, but now we're finding, no, they weren't crucified. What we meant to say, and what we probably should have said, is that they were just pictured, apparently, with their arms outstretched. Now, the Im image that immediately comes to my mind is the one that was on the cover of the Jesus Mysteries, the freaking Gandhi book that has this picture of what, lo and that I know Jordan Maxwell and Acharya have used a lot, um, and that I know is on the cover of the Zeitgeist thing or whatever, in that they used to say here, like in the in Zeitgeist Addendum, when they refreshed everybody on what the ancient uh, religions all seemed to be telling us about that they were just Jesus repackaged, showed this little this little uh, amulet that apparently was supposed to be Di Bacchus or Dionysus in cruciform. But uh, what you don't find about that is that that amulet uh, is dated to be, you know, conservatively uh, the second century after Christ, but probably more likely the third and fourth century. And that it, it concludes, concluding basically that however reliably or unreliably that the amulet does not show a crucified pagan, but is actually showing a crucified Jesus. Um, now, you could also, it's also helpful to note that what you're seeing in that picture is uh, an artist representation, not the actual amulet itself, too. I'll link in the notes in the show where they show where this is just a 4th century piece of jewelry that's clearly forged and that freaking Gandhi has essentially been busted. But now she tells us that what, the, the, what we have to say that Horus was crucified was, of course, not Horus, but Osiris, and that it was on this Jed pillar. Now you spell Jed, D-J-E-D, and find out what she's talking about here, and see if this looks to you uh, like uh, a cruciform, somebody that is crucified. See if you saw this picture, and you said, oh, didn't you know that Osiris is crucified? Yeah, yeah. here's, here, here's the proof of it. And that's what Acharya is saying. It's like, no, they weren't, they weren't crucified. They were in cruciform. Granted, the one that we showed you in Zeitgeist Addendum is a fabrication. Uh, but, but here's the proof, the Jed Pillar. Also, I want to point out that all of her answers to these questions about the Zeitgeist Challenge have had the same style, which is, well, no, he wasn't really crucified. Or, no, well, I mean, he actually wasn't killed in any real sense, like we said in the movie, or he wasn't really born of a virgin. I mean, his mother wasn't actually a virgin when he gave birth to him. Or no, well, I mean, he wasn't actually, you know, born on December 25th in one sense. I mean, he was born every day of the week, and I guess you could might as well pick December 25th as any other. All of these are just, are, are lies. It, 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 every answer to the question is, well, we, that's not true, but let me explain. We have him with the Ankh, which is the crux ansata. It's a cross. Right. We have Osiris in this form with Isis and Mary, uh, Isis and Nephthys, who are called the two Merti, on either side of him. This is almost like a, a astounding parallel with Christ, with the two Marys on either right. side of him. I've got these two images juxtaposed. Okay, that's classic Acharya S. She will uh, find what she has and then try to find some parallel in the Bible. In this case, she says... Uh, two Marys on either side of him, I mean, and of course, there, Jesus was crucified between two thieves, not two Marys. She's not really mentioning what she actually, she would love for that to be the parallel, but there's just Mary uh, Magdalene apparently at the crucifixion, and as well as his mother also viewing it, so that's what she's meaning by in between two Marys there, um, and that's, of course, assuming you buy her Isis is Mary from the Roman uh, mystery religions, and you go through that whole thing, which people a lot smarter than me have debunked that thoroughly. And of course, they wouldn't have actually died from this crucifixion because it's just this Egyptian image that the Egyptians apparently didn't actually believe was any kind of crucifixion of Osiris or Horus. But Achari S. knows that that's what they meant by it. And um, the, her proof of that is that it's here is this picture of this pillar with arms next to two Marys, which aren't really Marys except in Achari S.'s mind. And so 
and Jesus wasn't even crucified in between two Marys. This is a, a series of lies. It's a the wicked web you weave when first you practice to deceive. You have to build every lie on top of one another until you've come up with this insanity. Right. And that's really the imagery we're trying to get across. Exactly. That this was copied whole cloth. And that if you were going to depict your God in cruciform and you didn't want to be like, well, <clears throat> hey, that's just another one of the same that we've already got. Uh, then you might make up a story and say, well, he was thrown to the ground by Romans and put, a, you know, actually tacked up onto a cross, which they didn't even do like that. They had this uh, stake. They didn't, necessar- they didn't necessarily put people in a cross shape like that. Right. So, but yeah, if you were trying to imitate, you know, the whole point is that this motif right, of simple. a god on a cross or in cross shape, this motif was very sacred prior to the Christian era. Uh, <laughs> yes. Well, this motif in Christianity, uh, the, the God on the cross, was not even depicted in uh, in artwork until like the fifth or sixth century. Exactly. So, so we don't even we find pre-Christian artifacts, or I should say, ar- artifacts. Well, we do find them in gods in cruciform and goddesses. And then she goes on to say that uh, the early church didn't. Uh, venerate the crosses, which I totally agree with. There wasn't any reason for them to. It's not a biblical concept to uh, venerate this cross. This is this is in fact something that uh, became a symbol, um, and it's a holdover from a lot of the uh, the Roman Catholic Church and things like that. And maybe not necessarily all of that, but I'm not saying it's a terrible bad thing to do. But it's certainly not something that uh, the early Christians did, or that you know the Bible talks about in any way. Uh, so yeah, so you know, even that is uh, is a kind of an erroneous concept. If uh, if this if there were, were people being crucified uh, in the ancient world, they weren't necessarily, as I say, put out on a cross like that. There was this uh, the word stavros in the in uh, the New Testament has different meanings. Also in the, in the New Testament in Acts. Christ is depicted as being hung on a tree. Right, exactly. And this is another motif. That and that's just, that's just like Attis, too. Attis was, had the festival of Attis in Rome, and they were put him on the tree, peg him to the tree as well in the same type of form. The but plain not, tree. Right, exactly. Yeah, sorry to right. interrupt um, you. <laughs> no, no. no uh, so, it, yeah, as far as Attis goes, um, you know, that, that was, uh, that's really easy to show where these uh, particular characteristics come from. Now, and they're... They're continually uh, restated by a number of authorities and scholars, modern scholars, and I have that in that ebook that I just created. Uh, but of course, this stuff wasn't written down until you know it, hundreds of years after Christ supposedly lived. So the uh, apologists like to say that the Attis story was based on Christianity and so forth because you know there's no writing down of this. Right. We're talking about, again, mysteries. We're talking about, this is a, uh, the God is certainly pre-Christian, without a doubt, or should I, should I say pre-common era, without sure. a doubt. And uh, from Diodorus, we can glean certain things. We can glean his, his death and his mourning. We've got uh, priests parading around with his image, which is a pretty common motif of a resurrection. They're saying, you know, in, in the Egyptian, they would say, this is Osiris, he has been risen, he has risen. Did you catch that connection that she says, that Diodorus says that people were, uh, you know, dancing around with images of this god, which to her means that, that he was resurrected. Also notice that they're talking about the Roman mystery religion version of this. Attis is, is, she's saying this is really easy to prove. We have all this writing. Of course, all that writing comes 200, at least 200 years after the time of Christ. And I'm saying from a scientific perspective, um, you can't know that that wasn't influenced by Christianity. You can't, that's the reason the Zeitgeist Challenge says, hey, if you want to prove that this God did all the stuff that you said it did, why don't you use the accounts before Christ so we can, you know, eliminate the possibility that it was influenced by Christianity? Because as she just got done and said, well, certainly the God was pre-Christian, but we don't have any writings until 200 years afterwards, which I'm saying is probably a part of what the general concept of the mystery religions did, is that they did, in fact, take the old gods and then attribute Christian qualities to them. Even what she quotes in the old, when she talked about this in the former debunking, she quotes a person to prove that Addis was resurrected. 
I just looked it up. His name was A.T. Fear, and he said that the Addis cult modified itself over the years, and it was probably a result of the challenge posed by Christianity. That's the quote from the person that she quotes from to prove that Addis was resurrected in the stories that were said 200 years after Christ. They would have his image. They would bring out his image out of the temple and say, see, here's the God. He's back again. And right. so if you have priests parading around with an image it's usually indicative that the god has risen so to say that i the addis was a dying and rising god is a, a pretty solid it's, certainly it's already been stated by uh some expert this mettinger for example dr mettinger is an extremely well respected expert on the resurrection motif we'll look at that in a second and that motif was there there's no doubt about it uh then you have the the whole virgin birth mystery again that is in certain uh, texts. But these texts now, in order to make kind of a list, you would have a problem with um, digging up Latin resources or Greek resources that are not readily translated that are not easily found, nobody's reciting these things, it tends to talk over the heads of the masses. Sure. This is why we have to bring it forth in multiple ways. One way is to bring it forth uh, in the digest that you've produced, which is much, you know, it's like very striking. Okay, here it is. Sure. Now, is this how the ancient world would have seen it? Well, in the case of Addis, yes, uh, the, the the Christians are actually complaining. Hey, they're copying us. They've got all the elements. So they must have seen it as being the same. This I find just um, fascinating because I know that Acharya knows that the scholars agree that the mystery religions change after Christianity to incorporate um, Christianity. And she's pointing to this idea that the Christians at that time of the Addis cult, 200 years later, were pointing to the Addis cult and others and saying, hey, look at these guys, they're all copying Christianity now. Have you guys seen what they're doing over at the uh, Addis temple? They're, they've totally copied Christianity. And she's saying because Christians are said, having sa said that, which would be obvious, um, as according to scholars, that's what these these cults did, is, is uh, they copied Christianity. And she's saying because Christians are pointing that out, that means that somehow or another that what appeared 200 years after Christianity somehow was the predecessor to Christianity. It doesn't make any logical sense, but she's just saying that like she has no idea that the mystery religions, you know, incorporated Christian ideas into their mystery religions 200 years later. 200 years is a long time. That's like longer than the history of America. So it's kind of a big gap there between, you know, Christianity and this stuff showing up in Addis religions. And as she had mentioned, Addis, the actual God, was a very pre-Christian God that didn't have any of these attributes until much, 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 much later. You know, yeah. it's not just right. like some kind of weird uh, interpretation that we're putting on it right now. We're not putting a spin on it. The Christians themselves were saying this. These guys are imitating us. So if they're, if they're that close to them... Now, as I point out, the, this uh, death and resurrection motif in the spring is right. unquestionably pre-Christian. We find it in the, the, the myth of Persephone. We find it in the story of Tammuz, uh, Dumuzi, in the Sumerian. It's been traced to the third millennium by the same expert messenger. Let me read from a book by William Lane Craig about this topic and specifically about T.N. Mettinger. But he starts uh, by quoting David Aoun, a specialist in comparative uh, ancient Near East literature, when he concludes, No parallel to them, resurrection tradition, is found in Greco-Roman biography. Indeed, most scholars have come to doubt whether, properly speaking, there really were any myths of dying and rising gods at all. In the Osiris myth, one of the best-known symbolic uh, seasonal myths, Osiris does not really come back to life, but in all simply con continues to exist in the nether realm of the departed. In a recent review of the evidence, T.N.D. Metten Mettinger reports, From the 1930s, a consensus has developed to the effect that the dying and rising gods died, but did not return or rise to life again. Oh, that's what this guy, who she's quoting as proof of this, says. Those who still think differently are looked upon as residual members of an almost extinct species. 
This is what her famous Mettinger says about, well, Acharya S., that she is looked on as a residual member of an almost extinct species. The uh, story of Persephone, who dies, and goes, well, they never say she dies, but she goes into Hades, which is the underworld where most people are dead. Right. She goes into Hades and she rises out. Persephone's rise was celebrated at least probably annually, but her her rise out of the underworld is when the spring comes. And I remember being taught this as a child. This was one of the fascinating myths that I actually understood. When you strip these myths of their, their nature-worshipping background and their astrotheology and so forth, they become uh, mystifying and strange and weird and unpleasant to, to sure. deal with. But uh, But when you... You tr when you put it into a sensible context like that, then we, oh, look at that. Well, of course, that makes sense. And so the placement of Christ's death and resurrection at Easter, springtime, is so convenient because that's when it was already being celebrated, the death and the resurrection of the god or the goddess. Now, wait a minute. Now, wouldn't the spring equinox is like March 20th, give or take, but the resurrection of Jesus was on Passover, not Easter, and Passover is like April, uh, you know, April eighth, April fifteenth, or whatever. To, you know, uh, that it's it's not it's not associated with the spring equinox at all. Uh, it was already being celebrated at that time. There's no two ways about it. Now we have these Addis celebrations going on at that exact time. Are they imitations of a guy who lived in Judea, or are they imitations? Are they uh, archetypical uh, representations of the spring celebration? Which makes more sense to you? Good point. I always thought it was very arrogant of Christian scholars to automatically assume that anything that happened over past 1 AD could have been ripped off from Christianity. Even the, in the festival of Attis, that, they had marked that at about the second century AD in Rome, where they were they were pegging Attis to a uh, to a pine tree and they were putting him in a tomb for three days, and he was resurrected. There you go. You have it from Peter Joseph saying it's really arrogant for Christians to assume that anything after 1 A.D. you know had to be an influence by Christianity. But then he says, you know, the Addis uh, things were he's trying to paint this as early, like right around 1 A.D. But this is 200 years later, an extremely long time, and he's saying it's arrogant for anybody to assume that these uh, this Addis cult uh, would have been influenced by Christianity in, in any way. And that's not me talking. That's not me saying, well, it seems like they probably would, you know, they, being in Rome and, and Rome obviously persecuting Christians for that 200 years. They probably would have at least heard about it. And he's saying it's arrogant. But scholars like A.T. Fear, who she quotes in support of, of her ideas, clearly doesn't support her ideas because he's saying that they clearly were copying Christian myths to in in response to Christianity. That's his words, A.T. Fear. This is historical historical information, but I haven't particularly sourced it. But they they come back with the Christians come back with the fact that oh that had to have been stolen. I just think it's incredible that that's the disposition that they take. You know, we have about 15 minutes left, and uh, let's let's jump around to some of these other gods that are on this site. Okay. So we we um, like for example, why don't you go into Dionysus a little bit? Okay. Well, Krishna, Krishna is in order, so let me let me go to the Krishna one because that, that's okay. Yes, for sure. Such an interesting. I love it. Uh, you know, this really has just allowed for more of this wonderful information to be dug up. So, you know, the, the people crying foul about the word virgin uh, describing Christian's mother. Uh, first of all, as far as I'm concerned, as you can tell if you read my book, Sons of God: Krishna, Buddha, and Christ Unveiled. Krishna, neither Krishna nor his mother are real people. So you got you got to disabuse yourself of the notion that these characters that we're talking about were real people. They don't have genitalia, and they're not considered to be you know penetrable or, or sulliable or whatever. Right. That you that you, you they are always virginal. Even Zeus, with all of his randy exploits, was considered a virgin. I think that she's trying to say that because these gods didn't actually exist they get to be virgins because they don't because they're not real they of course wouldn't have had any real sex and therefore are virgins in that sense and i could be wrong maybe she's trying to say something different but she's all, she could be implying that um you know christian apologists want are, are wanting primary sources that these gods actually existed 
and that's why they're asking for primary sources but that's not what I think anybody is trying to do they're trying to find out what did it say somewhere in ancient uh, you know in the ancient Hindi Hindu writings that um, that Devaki Krishna's mother was had never had sex at the time that she gave birth to Krishna was was it a miraculous birth in the sense that she had never had sex and gave birth to Krishna um, not whether or not she was some perpetual virgin or some mystery virgin, but that there was a virgin birth. Right. It's called Parthenos. You know, this goes on. It's it's just uh, these are myths. Okay, so if you start looking at the mythology behind Krishna and Devaki, you start seeing well, Krishna looks like a very very much a solar myth, a sun god, and Devaki is starting to look a lot like a dawn goddess. She's the incarnation of Aditi, who is the dawn, the virginal mother goddess of the dawn. In, uh, in going back to the Rig Veda, uh, you know, prior to the common era, a thousand years or more. Right. So, I'm not sure what she means by the virginal mother of the dawn. Maybe that if she was, I think that she's trying to say that if she's actually just the dawn, and I'm pretty sure this is what she's trying to say. And 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 he's the sun and she's the moon. Then of course she would be virginal because moons don't have sex. You have this concept of the virginal dawn giving birth to the sun every morning. You know how the morning sky is so clear and clean and refreshing, and it's but then you, if you have this like rosy fingered dawn, as Homer put it, you've got this brilliant morning sunlight coming up. It's just very striking, and you can see why it would be considered virginal. Again, notice her answers are always, well, no. I mean, Devaki wasn't a virgin. She had seven children uh, before she gave birth to Krishna. That's what it says. You know, whether or not she's real or not, that's what it says. But if she is like a symbol of the sky, um, then maybe she's a virgin because, you know, the skies don't have sex because it's a sky. And, you know, in the morning it kind of seems sort of virginal. So, yeah, uh, yeah, Chris, Krishna's mother was a virgin as long as she's a sky and stuff. Absolutely. Just absolutely pure and you know newly born and so there's that case to be made which I make in Sons of God about Krishna's mother being uh, an incarnation or a uh, she is the incarnation of Aditi in traditional mythology and the Aditi is the sun goddess but you know interestingly enough there's a there's a myth attached to her where she as a teenager presumably a virgin teenager uh, eats the seed of a mango and becomes pregnant. So, you know, Krishna's mother very much was a virgin mother. Whether or not she is when she gives birth to, to Krishna is is uh, the issue. However, no, that is the uh, They go on and on because, you know, she had other children before him. Again, we're talking about a mythical character. We're not talking about a real person, like the Virgin Mary who supposedly has other children. Uh, in fact, they end up with the same or similar number of children. There's a perpetual virginity going on here, but if you if you uh, in so insist, change the word to chaste instead of virginal, and uh, call it a miraculous birth. The difference is the same. Right. Krishna was born of a miraculous birth. So now we can move on from there. But all of this stuff is written down, and it's quite fascinating. Oh, there are by the way, there is this virgin birth mystery in Indian texts. The Mahabharata goes into it. We have a, a goddess. The goddess Kunti says, without a doubt, through the grace of that god, I once more became a virgin. Again, she can argue this perpetual virgin thing all day long because it's it's not biblical at all. Mary in the Bible is not said to be a virgin f perpetually. In fact, it's quite clear that Joseph and Mary, after she... ...with Christianity. Uh, Dionysus, same thing. Whether or not his mother Semele could be deemed a virgin, you know, is it stated in the ancient text that she was Parthenos? Parthenos, by the way, if you can't find this stuff, go look up the word Parthenos, Parthenogenic, Parthenogenic, genetic, genetic, genetically. You look up these words. This is the word that's used by scholars to describe this virgin birth phenomenon. I've seen it used in uh, describing. Neith, again, this Egyptian goddess dating back, it's like 7,000 years, this concept of the virgin mother goes back. Like 7,000 years, right? Wow. Uh, you don't necessarily see this. They don't spell it out. They use the word parthenos. And if you don't know Greek and you don't, you know, you don't know the other languages, can't research in foreign languages, you won't find this. It's not in the encyclopedia. If you open the encyclopedia, 
uh, you can't look up Parthenos and where it says virgin birth motif that predates the Christian era by thousands of years. It, they just don't have it in there. They use these these scholarly terms that you, that go over your heads. Okay. Right. Exactly. So. Well, let's take a look at the Greek English lexicon and see if it goes over our head. But first, I want to point out that Shemael, the mother of Dionysus and all the texts, um, she's not said to be a virgin in the, in the story. It has nothing to do with her not having sex or not. In fact, the baby that she gives uh, is taken by Zeus and so, that he's the father of, sows it, um, sows the baby in his leg, so she doesn't even give birth to him, let alone you know a, a virgin birth. And even if she is called, which I'm not even sure by the way, just by the way that Acharya kind of bounced around there, I doubt that she actually is called Parthenos. Uh, Dionysus, same thing. Whether or not his mother Semele could be deemed a virgin, you know, is it stated in the ancient text that she was Parthenos? But even if she is, um, the the term the term according to the Greek English lexicon that's supposedly supposed to go over our heads, the second definition is unmarried women who are not virgins. Um, and so, I just, this whole thing is just getting crazier and crazier. Uh, yeah, okay, so Dionysus, uh, turning water into wine, easy one, it's in Theodorus, Siculus. Uh, December 25th, no question about it, Macrobius states that. Now, Macrobius is the 4th century of the Common Era. Right. However... However, we have Dionysus tradition uh, being born on the sixth or seventh. Was it the fifth or the sixth? Fifth or sixth of January, and there is very much good reason to believe that that was, you know, that that certainly was before Macrobius moves it to the winter solstice. Is there any doubt now that they are just telling everybody the mystery religions that when they say, "Oh, Dionysus was born on December twenty-fifth." according to the 4th century mystery religion cult that this in in a certain in one calendar or another this time the 5th and the 6th were also the winter solstice so the effect is the same right. exactly Dionysus and there's also a re christian religion in existence now that uses the the january 6th as the celebration right. of today right yeah, the orthodox and the Armen i think it was the armenian they right. believe that christ was born on the um, on the 6th of January, which also right. was the birth of Ion, in mm -hmm. the uh, in also December 25th was too. Uh, these, the effect is the same. It's the winter solstice. It's the sun. It's the birth of the sun god. The effect is definitely not the same. You said in the movie that Dionysus was said to be born on December 25th. And then when the Zeitgeist Challenge asks you to produce a source before the time of Christ that says this, you say that you can't, but you do have one 400 years later, which is clearly influenced by Christianity and part of the Roman Dionysus mystery cult. Then you say that's the proof. And then you go on and say, well, since um, some Christians celebrate the birth of Jesus on this other pagan day, there's some kind of proof right there. But all it proves is exactly what I've been saying the whole time, is that this is exactly the same time when all the pagan ideas and holidays were being forced onto Christianity by Rome, who had then at this time started to take it over, right around 300, 400 uh, AD. And so they're just validating that concept. So uh, again, you know, there's all these intimations of Christ being a sun god, uh, having to do with, uh, there's so many different, a lot of oh, my yeah. work has to do with that. I have this entire book, Jesus as a Son, throughout history. Actually, that's, it's not a book yet, but they have an e-book written on that. Uh, let's see, King of Kings, God's Only Begotten Son, uh, Protogonos would be the which is kind of the firstborn, really. Uh, that right. Dionysus called the firstborn. Alpha and Omega, ancient inscri inscription apparently. The research I found on that was in French. If you didn't know French, you probably wouldn't be able to fit, find it. Because she mentions this is an ancient inscription. She never says how ancient. And I don't think that she really intends to because it's a big problem. And the reason is that the book that she's quoting is uh, t is taking another man's work out of context. That This French guy named uh, Buissobre in his book, The History of Manichaeism, which basically is a history of Gnosticism. 
because he was, as far as I could tell, a, a, a Protestant uh, reformer guy who was exposing Gnosticism, which was really only possible after the, uh, the breaking free from the Catholic Church, who, in my opinion, um, uh, was accusing people when they were exposing Gnosticism of being part of uh, you know, the Cathars or whatever, and their lives were in danger for exposing Gnosticism because um, of the widespread adoption of Gnostic pr principles and beliefs for thousands of years in the Catholic Church. So anyway, this French reformer says the following about this inscription, this Gnostic ins inscription, this very post-Christian era inscription, uh, as he's trying to expose Gnosticism. He says, this amulet, it is says, it is I who lead you, you and everlasting, you look. It is I who keep you or save, I am Alpha and Omega. There below the inscription, a snake holding its tail in its mouth, and around the circle it describes uh, Greek three letters, which are the number 365. The snake, which is usually an emblem of eternity, is here that the sun and its revolutions. Keep in mind, this is from Google Translator, so uh, it's a little weird. So I, Acharya, in a roundabout way, quotes this and says it proves that Dionysus was called Alpha and Omega before Christian times. But not even the Gnostics themselves would buy that whopper based on this. We know very well what Bisobre was referring to, and it's called the Abraxas. And it's exactly how he's describing here. It's got the serpent and the serpent tail. You can go look at a picture of this. It's got the 365, you know, even the Alpha and Omega. But what she's not telling you is that this is in, was invented by uh, Belsides in the early 2nd century, who was a, a chief of a Gnostic sect of the same, his name. Now, the hilarious thing about this is that she's telling you that Alpha and Omega is what they call Dionysus, and this is her proof of that, and she is quoting, essentially, a Gnostic uh, uh, amulet that the very definition is influenced by Christianity. Second century Gnosticism was nothing except for influenced by Christianity. So in no way, shape, or form is this proving that Dionysus was called the Alpha and Omega? Uh, uh, let's see, death and resurrection, that's easy. That's, that's a no-brainer. I, I, how anyone could not find how Dionysus being described as dying and, ri and resurrecting right. is uh, they haven't studied for even five minutes. Well, you know, I would say that if you study for five minutes, you'll be struck with how many versions of Dionysus' death there are. And considering there's so many, you would expect one to be kind of close. And I, I, I would give this to her because I've always thought that this is about as close as it gets, this, this one uh, thing. Uh, and that's because uh, Dionysus was annually killed. I remember Dionysus was the god of wine. So he was annually killed, dismembered, and resurrected, which is a symbol of grapes, you know, being annually picked and squashed and turned into wine and then growing again next year. Well, we're running out of time. Let's jump into Mithra for the last five minutes. Right. Okay. Born of a Virgin. I have some lovely uh, research on that in in this uh, Zeitgeist Challenge ebook that I just created. Uh, it's just absolutely beautiful. For, first of all, the in order to get away with this this fraud uh, about primary sources again, we hear this nonsense that there was nothing written down. Uh, well, they they say nothing was written down about Mithra because his his was a mysteries cult. Of course, there were many mysteries cults, and there was stuff written down about them, but nothing was written down. So they're they're actually admitting that the mysteries were not written down, but they were there. So there was something right. to them. Yes. Uh, but in the case of Mithra, uh, there was a bunch of stuff written down, and uh, there were multiple volumes of it, and yet they were destroyed. Uh, why were they destroyed? You know. No, I don't know. I wish she would tell us where where she knows what was in them and what they said if they were destroyed. That would be extremely important information. And then there was also the, just a massive amount of of ruins that we still dig up now and again, fortunately, but. It was huge all over Europe. There was all this Mithraic remains, and right. so we have this. And this is before Christianity had any prominence at all. So you know, to say that Mithraism copied from them is just ludicrous. It was right. all over the place. Notice that she said it was before Christianity had any prominence. Clearly, it was after Christianity. Uh, but there, you know, this claim that the Mithra is uh, self-generated out of a rock, and therefore there's no virgin mother. Well, according to the Iranian scholars. And, uh, and uh, texts, I guess they're Armenian texts, 
Mitra had there was virgin birth. His father was born of a virgin, and apparently he all too too was identified with his father. And so the uh, Iranian or Persian, remember Mer Mitra is a Persian god, and I think that perhaps the Persian scholars know more about the subject than Christian apologists. Sure. Uh, <laughs> that uh, you know, Mitra's father was born of uh, a virgin who becomes pregnant from the water of the milky fountain of immortality. So, in other words, Mitra wasn't born of a virgin. He was born out of a rock. But his father was born in a miraculous kind of way, much like every Greek god in the history of Greek gods is said to have a weird way of entering the world. But that does not equate to his mother being said to have been a virgin before she had him. Remember, the Bible says that Mary had Jesus even though she hadn't had sex before. That's what was being implied. And so the movie Zeitgeist and all of Acharya's books, when they say that Mithra was born of a virgin, they're obviously trying to draw a parallel that the mother of Mithra similarly had a child without having sex before. But then we get this explanation. Oh, well, Mithra was born out of a rock. He didn't have a mother. But his father had some weird stuff happen when he was born. <laughs> This is not copying Christianity. There's nothing even remotely resembling that they just they took it. If anything, the copying was the other way around because it was taken from these cosmic concepts and it was turned into a real person. It was given a mundane origin as opposed exactly. to what the original was. It has to do with the dawn. It has to do with Virgo. It has to do with this lovely milky fountain of immortality, all these great cosmic concepts that have now been really kind of bastardized. And by being put into history and claim that this was a historical virgin birth and blah blah blah. Sure. The whole concept has actually been ruined by this. You know? this, <laughs> this forced anthropomorphization, this right. historicization is, has yeah. actually ruined all these wonderful cosmic concepts that right, exactly. permeate. Yeah. So when you restore, I'd like to say this it's a good place to say this. Uh Mitra, by the way, these other things are easily shown to be true. Uh, you know, the, the 12 disciples, it, we can call them companions, if you like, because there were several, uh, the, the, there would have been a lot more if they hadn't been, all of the ruins hadn't been destroyed, everything had been destroyed. That Here he is uh, depicted in the center with the 12 uh, signs of the zodiac around him. Repeatedly we see Mitra depicted in iconography like that. Again, this is the Roman mystery religions after the time of Christ. You just forgot to mention that one again, I guess. So t Mitra and the Twelve. The point is not whether they were called disciples, which is a you know, nice Greek word. The point is that they were called uh, companions or friends, or that just that here was a God-man with Twelve. Okay? Don't, right. don't get hung up on whether or not they used those words. That, those right, are exactly. straw man arguments. And I suppose pointing out that this is hundreds of years after the time of Christ, that that's a straw man argument, too. Because scientifically speaking, it's clear that they were influenced by Christianity, and that this is what the mystery religions provably are, are doing. This is what Gnosticism set the bar to do, to take Christi Christianity and inform it into the pagan religions. That's what the Catholic Church did. This is a pattern over and over and over. When you say mystery religions, that's what you are meaning. The, the forming of Christianity into the ancient pagan traditions. This is what Bill Cooper was talking about. This is why, if Bill Cooper was still alive today and he didn't get killed right after 9-11, that there would be no Zeitgeist. There would be no Acharya S. or uh, Michael Tassarian or, or Jordan Maxwell. And uh, you can see my movie, William Cooper Debunked Jordan Maxwell, for more on that, because I know that he interviewed him. Uh, and so there would be no opportunity for it, because if he was still a leader in this uh, movement of people that are seeking truth, this stuff would be so exposed, it would be so obvious to truth seekers what has happened uh, with Peter Joseph and Acharya S. and what's happening as this is part of the externalization of the hierarchy. That is, indoctrinating the, the awake world into the mysteries. That's what be, was being talked about, what the, the preparation, the, the externalization of the mysteries is what uh, Alice Bailey called it. Uh, the hierarchy uh, is what uh, you know, uh, others call it. But the purpose is, is to indoctrinate the truth seekers out there into this new mindset. 
for a specific reason because the what they're eventually going to try to pull with a, a world system, a world socialist system, is going to require a new kind of unifying religion. This is extremely as important, if not more important, than the infrastructure of the world government and all the cameras and the chips or whatever that they're putting up around us. This is more important than that because in that system you still need a direct sort of obedience. And as, uh, as Blavatsky said, this the externalization of the hierarchy is for one purpose, the preparation of people for the what she calls the world teacher. And if you go listen to Lucius Trust Radio or whatever, they're all abuzz about the world teacher coming. And so what this does is it, it gets pe in people's mind this idea of the return of the many avatars of ancient uh, times. And so if they can essentially put somebody at the, at the helm of this that will seem like an ancient avatar and they can produce some sort of you know supernatural stuff in order to you know really get the world thinking is this just like when Krishna or Buddha came uh, is this the Christ consciousness that's returned at this very important time in history and then all of a sudden this will be like this is a real deal God here on earth this is a real deal God you know that is what this is all preparation for and that's why the externalization of the hierarchy is so big. That's why the day that Zeitgeist, you know, came out uh, or, and got popular, that they lifted the ban on Google uh, Video for conspiracy movies. As long as Zeitgeist was number one, uh, they were quite quite all right to lift that ban and let people begin to uh, learn about 9/11, learn about the Federal Reserve. But that's even part of this plan. It's because pretty soon it's going to be the the recognition that the old system is broken and in, in in the same thing that zeitgeist provided which was a hatred of the old system's dogma is extremely important to the bringing in of the new system which i think will try to be brought in around 2012 and they're really going to try to put out a lot of propaganda about 2012 because they need people to think this is the beginning of the new enlightenment when we shed off the old baggage of religion that wrong religion that was the cause of all this war there will probably be a war that will be propagated by people that have the power to do that kind of thing and they will certainly make sure that the media and everyone else blames it on the judeo-christian religions uh, they have been funding radical islam in order to uh, you know use that for the same purpose to point to it all at the end of all this and say look at what religion has done you know, let's let's get rid of it, and that will allow for the one thing that I found hard in the Bible to believe, which is that in the future, Christians will be outright uh, killed in some politically correct uh, world government. The Christians will be able to be killed. It doesn't make sense. This new system will provide what seems to be a utopia. That's why the Zeitgeist movement is such an obvious. Uh, part of this is because that's the kind of thing that's going to be offered to us at the end of this. We will believe as truth seekers that when this happens, that this will all be, um, you know, done with. That we've defeated the new world order and we're offered a grand utopia where the problems of the past are now proven to be false because we've shown some new thing, whatever it may be, aliens or you know, they'll they'll produce something that will, for a time, make everybody validated and that religion really was false and now we can just wash our hands of God and begin this new thing without religion and, and join this new situation and so it will seem like like the